Well, hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I know that the New Year's kicked off and uh, all of Christmas is behind us. And in a normal year, right after Christmas, when I was a pastor was when I ended up doing a whole lot of funerals. Uh, right after Christmas is when the counseling load actually went up for me. And you would think when the holidays are over, everything's calm, but it, it's not as easy as just lose 10 pounds and balance your checkbook and have a resolution. It, it's a hard time. So I wanted to take some time today and got really lucky and got uh, two friends willing to come on and visit with us about how we deal with the emotional stress of the pandemic and of just general life, particularly even in January. So joining me today, Dr. John Walker, uh, Dr. Walker is an amazing, amazing counselor. Uh, he has, uh, I, I say it this way, John, forgive me if it's wrong, but I, he has the client list no one ever wants made public. Uh, <laughs> John has worked with some of the most amazing pastors and leaders over the years who, when they go through struggles, like we all do, uh, he's there to help them and, and get them to an even stronger place than before. And also joining me is Dr. Charity Byers, uh, Dr. Byers is the succession plan for Dr. Walker and also his daughter. So welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank We're you so glad very to be with much, you. William. Yeah, Dr. Walker, I'd love to start with you. And then uh, in true succession fashion, we'll just kick you off the call in a while if you're not offended by that. And uh, yeah, yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Tell us a well, little bit your story. I, I, I'd love to just... Yeah, well, the, uh, Blessing Ranch came into creation um, in, in a pretty remarkable way with, with uh, an amazing encounter with the Lord back in the early 90s that just said, uh, John, I need you to build a Christian leader resource and renewal center. Mm -hmm. And that was really the beginning, was, was just a word from the Lord saying, got a job for you to do. And, and the language was actually very specific. I need you to build a Christian leader resource and renewal center. Wow. Well, for the first 25 years of, of the history of Blessing Ranch, we were very, very strong on the renewal piece. And so we've had over 4,000 pastors, missionaries, and their families through our intensive model um, since the early 90s. And, and it's been great. But here's where I'm going with the story. Um, one of the best things I did three years ago was I fired me as the ex executive director of, of Blessing Ranch. And it was time. Um, but the coolest thing ever then from my perspective was being able to name then my youngest daughter, Dr. Charity. Uh, to lead Blessing Ranch into the future. And we said, we have no idea what that will look like. Um, but why I get excited about Charity's leadership is she's been able to lead the ranch into a position where we are now poised to be the resource center as well. And I'll let her tell you more about that. But it, it's a very exciting time for us. It couldn't be cooler as a father than to see uh, Charity just blossom and grow uh, as a person, but then really as a leader and being able to lead our organization. So uh, we're excited to be here with you today, William. Very excited. And, and excited to not be here with us in an office, but a little ways away. You can make some space now, right? Yeah, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Hey, when you think about the succession, I always tell people I'm not very good at this. I need to get better at it. But my uh, annual review, which just happened, is a, a one question review and it's a pass fail test. And the question is, this year, did I make myself less necessary to the growth and running of our company? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's pass fail. Uh, some years I do better than others. This year was probably not as much of a pass. It was a pretty weird year where I had to be a little more involved than normal. But uh, how, how, what advice would you give people uh, who are on the short side of where you are, maybe where I am? Uh, you know, I'm early 50s or maybe even accelerated a little bit to 60. And oh my gosh, this pandemic has got the job. This isn't what I signed up for. What advice would you give folks who are starting to think down the road of succession through either what you've learned or what you've counseled others? 
I, you know, uh, I'll give a thought or two and then Charity, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on that as, as well then. Um, in, in our specific situation, uh, I was the founder of Blessing Ranch. And, you know, that has its upsides, that has its downsides. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put this in the context of Einstein and, and his statement about insanity. You know, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome, well, that's pretty insane. Um, and so it was time to do something different. The big question then is how do you let go? I, th I think I'm an intuitive leader. Um, and so I run quick, I run fast, I make decisions very rapidly. And that's not charity style. Charity is more reflective. She's much more like her mama. Um, and, and she loves collaboration where I was much more of a lone ranger. And the biggest thing, and it sounds so trite, but it is so real, is how in the world after all these years do I let go? Mm. When I actually have a little bit of experience, when I you know, have a few thoughts about what works and what doesn't work and have stubbed my toes enough, um, but the reality is if charity is not given free reign to lead and in a way that works for her as well as the organization, uh, then she'll always be stifled. And so in our unique relationship, uh, her growing edge was she had to learn how to lead beyond her father's shadow. Mm. And, and that was really, really important for her development, but it was also really important for my development. So that would be the one singular thought, you know, I have is, is existing leaders have to learn how to let go and not become a part of the founder syndrome, which says, yeah, I kind of sort of letting go, but I'm going to continue to run this thing from afar or through back channels or whatever the case might be. And, and how Charity has responded has been remarkable in, in my estimation. She's grown from this uh, shy little girl when, when she was uh, a little girl to this amazing leader now. And I think that's because, partially because she was given the freedom mm -hmm. to lead in a way that worked for her, not in a way that worked for me. That's so good. Yeah, you, you know, you all have helped us over the years with many successions where we've sent you the incoming person to help get them onboarded mm -hmm. or the outgoing person to help them. And, and in all the successions we've done, I'm yet to meet the pastor who said, you know, I'm rounding out my career. Uh, I want to finish well. I think what I'll do is I'll go high control and blow up my church. I, I, yeah, I'm not right. anybody who, <laughs> so, so either or both of you, what are the mental traps people should watch out for as they're trying to let go. And I think the enemy tells them, no, you have to stay in control. So, so are there some triggers or mental traps that, that either of you would mention that uh, we might look out for? You, you want to take a stab at that or you want me to, Charity? Well, I'll, I'll just uh, give one thought here and then maybe you can add another. Uh, th this may be an obvious thought, but I think the biggest thing we're always watching out for is our pride. And, you know, again, nobody sets out to say, I'm going to be an egotistical leader that's full of myself. But, um, you know, when it comes to succession, you know, what, what we're having to let go of is everything we've invested in for decades and everything that feels so dear and personal and everything that has represented, you know, what we hope to, to say is a life well lived. And, you know, when we get to heaven, God say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we're having to let go of all of that and let somebody come in and perhaps do it differently. So it may not always be the arrogant person who um, falls into that trap of pride. It may also just be the average person who just, um, you know, in some sense wants to guard and protect everything that has felt so dear to their heart. Um, so I think we just all have to be on the lookout for that trap of pride in our heart and just truly be able to stand upon what has been and let something new be ushered in without it really threatening um, any of what that has meant for our own um, value, our own contribution over the last many years. Mm -hmm. And very, very similar, I would just hitchhike onto that 
and and say um, it's just so easy to think my way is the best way, you know, and, and therein lies the pride that charity is talking about, you know, um, and, and somehow believe that I'm the only one that has this vested insight into what's best for our organization. And the, and the truth is, and, and actually I, I, I put this into words with charity, I think Blessing Ranch has risen as high as it can under my leadership. Hmm. And it's, 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 it's really time to make way for movement. And that's exactly what's happened. And I don't think that movement would have happened under my leadership. Uh, so respect uh, is a great deal of, of what's involved in going forward, mutual respect versus pride, and the ability in letting go to be able to say um, another major mental trap is to think I'm the only one that has real insight into this organization. Mm. And um, if, if, if I step back, it's just going to all crumble. Well, the reality is it might, but it also might ask, actually escalate and go in a whole new direction, which is where Blessing Ranch is poised now. That's great. Well, Dr. Walker, thanks so much for taking time uh, in succession fashion. We're going to get you out of the relay zone and, and uh, focus. Outstanding. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Great to see you, William. Blessing. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a wonderful conversation with Charity. Thanks. Charity, it is so good to see a succession in real time. And I'm just wondering, you're stepping into this. Tell us a little bit. So, so let's back up just a little bit. Tell okay. us about Blessings Ranch. A lot of people wouldn't know, is that a place? Is it a website? Is it a, what, what is it? Yeah. And, and then how long you've been doing what you're doing? And let's springboard into some uh, real time issues that people are facing. Okay. Well, as uh, John mentioned a little bit ago, it's been about a 25 year history for Blessing Ranch and it began, you know, with that call that God put on his heart. Uh, Blessing Ranch once upon a time was much more of a place than it is today. Uh, it began as a large ranch out in northern Colorado and it was kind of a retreat. Uh, for Christian leaders where they would come and, and spend a week and receive, you know, intensive counseling as they were with us. And about six years ago, we transitioned the entire ministry from that ranch in Colorado to the Tampa Bay area of Florida. And so it's still in a sense is a place. It's just becoming much more than a place. So we've preserved what we've always done, though not on a ranch in Colorado anymore. We still provide the intensive counseling services in the very same fashion that we used to do. And so that is still alive and it is still a huge heart of, of Blessing Ranch to care for the Christian leader. Uh, kind of what we say is we want every leader to be living well, leading well, and hopefully finishing well in the end. And so um, beyond it, just being a place, though, as he talked about earlier, uh, the original call of God was to be both a, a renewal and resource center. And so over the last few years, we've tried to become more than a place by trying to capture what it is that happens in our small counseling rooms and package it in a way that can be shared much more broadly uh, with the church community. And so one of the most recent things we've done is publish our first book, which is called Unhindered. And um, it really, it, it, is, it captures the process of heart change that we lead people through in our intensive weeks with them. Along with it, we've got a study guide, we've got a video course. We're just trying to do a number of things that can help translate, you know, what does take place one-on-one -on -one into some different, um, you know, ways of, of contributing uh, just to the church community. Wow. So, so jumping from there into uh, you guys are the experts, you help people who are in crisis. This has been a kind of a crisis year. I was talking to a, yeah. a friend of mine who is an attorney and he practices what's affectionately known as family law, although there are very few yeah. families left when he's done practicing law. That's right. And, uh, you know, I said to him, hey, uh, I, yeah. I don't know that I want to know the answer to this, but I'm guessing your pipeline for new work is pretty dang strong right now. And he yeah. said, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. So I, it, what's gone on that's brought us to this crisis point? And what are you seeing as unique challenges coming out of 2020 and into 21? 
Yeah, well, you know, if we just broadly reflect on what this year 2020 has been, you know, on one hand, there's nothing new, you know, as far as crisis is not new. And we can look around, you know, our, our own communities, our own country and across the world and just see strife and struggle and uh, suffering happening all over. So uh, in that respect, there's nothing new about 2020, except, you know, kind of what we are seeing right now is that, you know, 2020 has produced uh, what we call compression fatigue, kind of at a collective level. So compression fatigue is this idea that we get kind of pressed and squeezed by stress to the point that kind of our own protective mechanisms are weakened enough that something comes out of us that we don't recognize or something that we've been trying to hide. So, you know, we see this happen at an individual level all the time in our offices. You know, it's the person who's coming here with a, a personal crisis. Their life has imploded. Uh, ministry's falling apart. Marriage has fallen apart. Everything around them is just falling apart. Um, but right now, what we're experiencing, again, is kind of this collective compression fatigue, where it's not just the individual. It's, you know, it's the family. It's the church community. It's you know, our society just sort of experiencing this together. And so I think what we've kind of watched happen actually over this year is that because of these circumstances that 2020 has brought to our lives, we've seen it really open this window into our inner world. So the way that that's happened again is with this compression fatigue that's taking place in our life, it strips us of all the things that are our protectors. So that might just be our predictable life, the ways that we feel in control, um, the ways that we are kind of just going along with our proven path of success. And those things help us feel okay enough so that we go on about our lives without sort of the shadow side of us or the weak link within us getting exposed as often. But under these kinds of circumstances, when all those things are stripped away, right, like our predictability, our capacity to feel in control, or just our proven paths of success, um, you know, it, it strips us of those protective mechanisms and these other parts of us start to show themselves in ways that we don't often see. And so I think the unique opportunity of 2020 is actually having a window opened into our inner world. And we can either look at that as a really, really bad thing that we want to avoid and just say, cover that back up. Or we can really challenge ourselves to take a closer look and, and sort of face what I think is a unique and actually pretty amazing opportunity to begin to understand our own hearts differently. That is so good. I wonder, you know, my experience with you guys in the, in the um, crisis mode that a lot of people over the years have come for, how do I heal up? is I would love to have a field guide for how to avoid having to come to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so yes. like, I'm the, the optimist where the glass is half full, this yeah. coffee cup will be half full all day long, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. uh, what, are, what are some warning signs for people if they're like, I'm doing fine, I'm grinding on 21, vaccines are coming, everything's good. Yeah. What would be some of the, the oh, that's a yellow light, watch out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think a couple of quick things would be one, people are telling you they don't recognize something about you. They're saying, what's going on? That's not you. Um, this isn't like you. That kind of feedback we really have to pay attention to. Mm. I think another quick thing would be if we're seeing emotional reactions coming out of ourselves that don't match our circumstances. So it might be in either direction, an overreaction where, you know, you're seeing yourself over respond to a circumstance, or it may be actually an under response too, where you just don't feel what you think you should be feeling more of a, a numbing response where maybe I should be a little bit upset about that, but I'm just not anymore, or I should be uh, angry about that, but I'm just not anymore. So either an over response or an under response can be a great clue that something's going on inside of you, you need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, vocabulary words I've gotten tired of in 2020, pivot, <laughs> so tired. Um, honestly, I'm kind of tired. I, this, this risks sounding like I'm not making a big deal out of things, but I, I'm tired of the word unprecedented. Yeah, it, right. You, you know, and my, as I look at history, this is not, you know, Christians are not getting sawed in half for their faith. That's right. 
Uh, you know, a third of Europe died during the bubonic plague. That's not happening. This yeah. is this is not unprecedented. Yeah. Uh, I do think pastors particularly are faced with this really strange riptide of you've got a pandemic and yeah. you know who knows what to do with that unless you're over 100 years old and were alive and during the last one. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, or uh, not just that, but racial tension that in in my uh, limited experience and audience there are people taking it from all sides no matter what they say or don't say on the civil unrest around yes, racial that's right. and then thrown in there third you know we had this presidential election which kind of polarized and it's almost like ptsd afterward for right. people who are sitting out there saying i, I i'm just getting battered mm -hmm. what would be some words that you would have for immediate coping or encouragement mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, all of that is absolutely true. And, you know, numerous conversations that I've had with particularly pastors and leaders over the last couple of months, I think, you know, it, within those, one of the themes that I have heard is just that leadership has never felt more impossible. Mm. And uh, man, that really struck me uh, just to hear that from people. It's never felt more impossible to be a leader. And, and this isn't coming from the 20 somethings who are brand new to this game. It's coming from the fifties and sixties who have, have had a few decades under the belt of this. So I think there's great compassion for the impacts that this has had on everybody walking through these simultaneous hits. And as you said, you know, kind of these, the PTSD ish feelings that we sort of have now as a response. So you know, I think a, a couple of, of words to, to leaders in these positions, one of those would be uh, just to continue to remember why you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, <laughs> that may sound like a simple statement, but, you know, when we start to, to look at all of this before us and we envision 2021 and yeah, the, the calendar is going to roll over into a new year and maybe there's a vaccine on the way at some point, but, you know, this is not as if it's about to all be better in the coming days here or coming weeks here. So as we look ahead to all of that, we just have to remember, what is it that God has asked you to do? And why are you doing it? You know, there's so much to manage. Uh, all of the relational tensions from all of the things that you've named and, you know, still continuing to figure out the pivot and all of that. Um, but you don't have to be the expert in all of those things. You just have to remember what it is that God has asked you to do. And you can't be the champion of everything out there, though everybody may expect you to be. You have to know what has God asked you to do. And so I think you just have to hold dearly to that or otherwise you risk getting sort of overwhelmed by everything that's on your doorstep and everything that people are trying to put on you to do um, in the face of all of this stuff. So it's not to be ignorant of those things or to not... Um, you know, address what needs to be addressed, but just to remember, you know, the main thing that God has asked you to focus on and to do that well. Mm. And I think, you know, in addition to that, you know, one, a, a drum that we beat, of course, all the time with leaders is, you know, the, just the drum of soul care. And there's just never been a time where it's mattered more mm. than now after, you know, everybody has been through all of this over the last few months. And a lot of people are just feeling tired, beat up, uh, I'm done. I don't have anything left in me to give, especially with all of these circumstances that feel so impossible. And so, you know, everybody just has to keep in mind that you've got to be breathing life back into yourself as you go on and as you go through this. And so it, it sounds like um, a simple thing to say, everybody should know that by now, but the number of leaders who don't do it is pretty alarming. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a call to come back to some of the basics of just letting your heart have life breathed back into it by God as you try to navigate all that you're doing. Wow. So uh, I have made a, a prediction. It's actually not a prediction. It's just a, an observation of what I'm already see happening because people, people come to us thinking about making a change in their job before the j job change ever happens. Right. So we kind of get a, sure, yeah. we get a preview. Right. And I have seen record numbers of people saying it's time to make a change. Maybe yeah. it's somebody who's, they're not retiring, you know, but, but things have changed. Maybe they want to mm -hmm. move because they want to be near family. Maybe they're just touched. Yeah. So, and I'm also seeing people who are 60 to 62 years old 
who thought they had five more years left and now they're like, ah, I don't know. So help me understand, how do you delineate between when you're just tired and when it's actually time to make a change? Because I think changes happen when there's a shakeup and God has really shaken the tree hard this year. And there may be, there may be good reasons to seek out a change this year. I think 2021 will be the year of massive turnover. And I, I'd love mm -hmm. to have some advice from you about how to know when it's the right time to look for mm -hmm. something new versus mm -hmm. hunker down? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the first thing that it makes me think about is just trying to really notice the difference between your own internal voices and God's voice. Mm. You know, you, you basically need to examine your motivations for wanting to make that change. What is it that's inside of you that's telling you it's time to go? So, you know, what would be the wrong voices to listen to? Well, one would be maybe a voice of inadequacy that just looks at, you know, the, the challenges ahead and says, I don't have what it takes to do this. Clearly, there must be somebody better to do this than me. Well, God may not be saying that to you. It might be your own voice of inadequacy, and you better not be listening to that. Um, so, you know, another voice not to listen to, maybe a voice of fear. You know, maybe it looks ahead at all there is and it just says, I don't know how to control that. I don't have the answers. Um, so clearly it must not be me. Um, you know, maybe in another, uh, you know, direction here, you've been pretty beat up by some of the relational tensions that have been there through the elections and through the, the, the racial conversations. And, you know, you've just started to absorb that and the voice inside you says nobody respects you anymore. Um, you know, those are all just examples of voices that we better examine clearly. Uh, mm -hmm. We better recognize them as our own voices and not God's. And we better let God minister to those voices so that they don't get a vote in whether we're done or not. And yeah. so, you know, we've got to invite God in there to say, hey, what do you have to say about me? Instead of what all these circumstances and all of this external pain has tried to say about me. And let him into that conversation, because those are moments where I would say somebody is at risk of being prematurely done. So there are, of course, in different cases where God is leading somebody to do something new. Maybe it is time to be done. Uh, maybe you're not the right fit to take this organization into its future. And, um, you know, maybe he's got some different plans for you. So knowing what God's voice sounds like is, is it's just not motivated by pain. You know, in the first examples, they're all motivated by pain. I've been hurt and it's told me this. Inadequacy, shame, fear, you know, those are all pain-filled words. So you know those are not God. God's voice um, is free of those things. And so I think that's a good cue there to know who's talking. Wow, that is so good. And, you know, it's such a tightrope. I've watched it for years. I've tried to figure it out in my own life. But on the one hand... I like to run marathons. I, there's probably a boatload of counseling involved with unpacking that, but uh, <laughs> I like doing that. And I'm convinced that the times that I'm about to quit are the times that I, if I'll stick with it, I'll see a big, big breakthrough. Right. Yeah. But the right. shadow, the shadow side of that for me is I hang on to things too long sometimes. And I forget yeah. that, you know, Jesus was always getting in trouble with his friends and his disciples for moving from town to town and village to village. So I just, yeah. You know, anything that, that's so helpful to figure out when is it the voice that's God saying, hey, it's one big kingdom. Come work in this part. Right. And when is it? I'm just afraid or I'm tired. And yeah, you know. that's right. Yeah. So so let me shift gears just a little bit. We're yeah. uh, broadcasting this or dropping it or whatever the right word is. I'm getting old um, <laughs> during the winter time. So I live in Houston where you can still be outside in the winter, but most people can't. And so now they're stuck inside and they're yeah. probably stuck inside with the same people they were quarantined inside with. Right. Uh, on the one hand, God says, it's not good that people be left alone. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah. I am so tired of looking at you and you're making me crazy the way you do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any, um, there are no quick tips for counseling, but do you have any pointers for people who are kind of tired of being around the people they've been around and don't want to say it out loud? What, what would you say to people that are struggling with the togetherness of this last year or so. Yeah, absolutely. It's great perspective on, you know, 
just the impacts now, if even if you're not quarantined, it's too cold for so many right. people to get that space. And there's still so many limitations on our lives. You know, I think um, one of the first things to acknowledge here is that I think we have to just take a, take a look at our circumstances and decide whether they're just difficult or whether they're toxic. Mm. And I think we have to know the difference between those things to guide a little bit of our external response. Um, you know, if they're toxic, we need to respond a little bit more dramatically than if they're just difficult. If they're just difficult, um, I think it's, it's a call for us to just learn how to love people better. How do we become more patient? How do we become less judgmental? How do we, you know, just love the other um, in spite of some of their annoyances and that kind of thing? So I think that's just one quick thing to ask yourself. Is this just difficult or is this actually toxic? But I think, you know, one of the, the, the maybe the deeper things that I would call people to do is to um, challenge themselves in these kind of circumstances where we're just struggling with people around us to be become more curious than you are just cautious. Hmm. And let me explain what I mean by that. You know, cautiousness is this idea of, you know, I just need to maybe put up boundaries with people. I need to you know, limit uh, my interactions with them because they're just driving me crazy. That's about cautiousness. Um, but curiosity is a very different approach. Now, first of all, let me just acknowledge, I'm not saying that cautiousness is bad. Cautiousness is good uh, with people. We do need to have that measure in our life. But I think a much deeper need is to become curious with our own hearts. Become curious about how this is impacting me and why. So why do I feel what I feel when mm. I'm having a conversation with you? Or why do I respond the way that I respond when you do X, Y, or Z? And I think this is so important, you know, to, to become um, a student of our own hearts because there's so much power that we actually have to manage our own hearts, but we don't realize it. So we begin to think that the only answer here is to manage my circumstances, you know, either change your behavior or limit my exposure to your behavior. But actually, we have a lot of power by managing our own hearts. So I think we got to begin to to ask ourselves these kinds of questions, because this type of curiosity will really show you how to guard your heart in a powerful way. It will show you how your heart can be ministered to. So let's just take, for example, um, you know, if I use a personal example here, um, my husband struggles with some anxiety and sometimes, you know, his cautiousness in life, always wondering about the what ifs or how things could go wrong tends to drive me nuts, you know, sometimes. And I start to get really, really annoyed with that. And so I think I've got to get curious and I've got to ask myself, why is there such an annoyance with that? What is that saying about my heart? Mm. Is that hitting a sore spot within me? Meaning, uh, is it triggering some kind of pain within me? Is it a, a character issue that it's hitting where I'm not loving uh, patiently or unconditionally enough? Just getting curious about my own heart and being able to manage those things instead of just, you know, as I said, instead of just being cautious, really being curious. That's great. That's great. So as we as we drop this episode into uh, the front end of January, I, I'm reminded when we talk about performance reviews or somebody who's gotten in trouble at work and you're trying to figure out a path of correction or, or what have you, I always tell people, make the period of restoration or correction longer than two weeks at bare minimum. And they say, why? And I say, well, have you ever been to the gym the first two weeks of January? So it's absolutely right. crowded. Now, maybe not yes. this year, but uh, people are, but, but the sustaining of habits yeah. seems to be so rare. It's rare in my life. And I, mm -hmm. I see it as rare in others. I, I got to tell you outside of the Bible, probably the best book I've read in the last five years is Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. And uh, James Clear, I mean, an amazing, amazing yeah. book with, with not just uh, facts, but man, if you're a preacher and you want illustrations about keeping habits, <laughs> just buy it for the illustrations. Uh, but yes. as I read that, I thought he makes tiny changes that make a huge difference. What, yeah. what encouragement would you give to people who are like, I'm tired of making changes, or I just fell off the wagon and I lost my habit of change. Like, 
how would you encourage somebody who's struggling with the, uh, the, the battle of starting something new or sustaining a new habit? Mm-hmm. Well, it's so important. And, you know, those concepts of atomic habits are priceless. You know, it's such great resource to really show us how to turn just desire into great discipline in our life. Um, I think a couple of, of things. I think the, the first thing that I would just acknowledge is that, you know, this is probably very much in line with, you know, the, the heart of this book, but it's really just about simplicity and not complexity. And so that's the whole idea, right? Of you're, you're starting with very small changes that make a big difference. And so it's not just about wanting to add more and do more. It's also about going back to the, the heart of things and going back to the basics in our life. And so I think we have to just really be mindful of that as we're saying what needs to shift in my life. It's not always about new things that need to be added. It's often about coming back to things that have been lost. So that's just one, one simple perspective I'd throw out, but I think probably something I'd love to just highlight a little bit more is that, you know, as we're, we're thinking about somebody perhaps wanting to follow through with, um, you know, new, new year's resolutions, or they're, they're wanting to make a shift in their life and they're trying to, you know, employ all the great things they learned after reading Atomic Habits, what ends up happening to a lot of us is that we're just not able to win because there's too much competition within us. Mm. So what that competition is, is, you know, the things within us that have been written on our hearts that are actually competing with the new things we're trying to do. And so we often think that willpower is the answer, right? If I just will myself, if I just do it, if I just put it on my calendar, that, you know, that's my answer. And of course, those things are good. We need all of that. But there's just often an unaddressed competition that's going on in our hearts that we just don't even know is there. And it's often the reason why we find ourselves, you know, a month or two months down the road, just sort of giving up. So this internal competition, it's, it's like the thing within you that self-sabotages you. So it might be, for example, something you believe about yourself. That could be a source of internal competition. You know, maybe it's just this belief that you have that says, well, I, I pretty much fail at everything I do. So I'm bound to fail at this too. Mm. Well, you know, if you don't recognize that as your internal competition, what's going to happen? Well, of course you're going to fail at this too, because that's your expectation. Or maybe your belief about yourself is that everybody else really matters more than I do. So that's the person who's going to have a hard time putting uh, these, you know, good things in their own life ahead of what could be done on behalf of somebody else. And, you know, that's the heart of a servant for sure. And that's good, but you know, we can't lose the, the perspective of being good stewards of ourselves as well. So there can be those things we believe about ourselves that end up being the competition to all of these new things that we're trying to do. And it also can just be things we've learned to do over the years that sort of become the shoulds of our life. And they right. end up being the internal competition. So, you know, maybe an example of that would be um, we've just learned to... Um, be a people pleaser. And that's kind of our way of feeling okay in life. If we just keep everybody around us happy, yeah. well, maybe that's competing with the thing that you're trying to do differently in your life, or maybe kind of your should in, in a, a different sense is I'm just supposed to beat myself up for everything I do. That's just the way I do life. You know, I do something and I just, you know, have to criticize myself and beat myself up. Well, maybe that becomes the competition for whatever it is you're trying to do. So, you know, with all of that said, we've got to recognize that there is internal competition here often going on with a lot of these shifts we're trying to make in our life. And if we don't address those things, then our, our willpower and our great disciplines that we have just tend to fall short. So our response really needs to be to unhinder our hearts from these things within us and, um, you know, allow God to rewrite that story within us so that we've got no competition left. It is so good. Well, so many things to take away here. And I'll, I'd love for people to know how to get in touch with you or yeah. with Blessing Ranch. Um, that's not a ranch, but we still but, have a facility so we, we're, we're still blessing ranch yeah. yeah oh yeah no how can people get in touch with you yeah. yeah well you know one of the best ways to find us would be our website it's blessingranch.org 
You can also give us a call. Phone number is 970-495-0920. And if you want to check out our, our brand new book, Unhindered, you can find that at availleadership.org slash unhindered. And we are giving away uh, free copies. You just pay shipping. So if you want to take advantage of that offer, you can find it on that website. Wow. Well, I am so glad, Charity, to have gotten to spend the time with you and the future for Blessing Ranch is bright. I, Thank uh, you. I'm glad to see you take the reins. And, Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, yeah, it's a long shadow to get out from under, but I, it, you're right. already doing it. And so That's yeah. right. But as he said, he's given me freedom to do that. So yeah. thank you very, very much. And let me just say to everybody listening out there today, if you're fatigued and we didn't hit on your issue, hey, you're not alone. I mean, this has been a killer year, year and a half. And uh, maybe one of the best things I've seen come out is a real conversation about mental health and about the, the need to get help if you really are feeling down. So I would encourage you to call Blessing Ranch to seek out professional help if you need it. it, it you're not alone if you think you're, you're messed up because uh, that is why Jesus came. We all are messed up at one point or another. So uh, if you, if you wanna get in touch uh, with Charity, follow the links there. You can go to vandercast.com and receive show notes and links to everything and an update on what's coming next. We'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Hang in there, find some good health and be prepared. 2021 will get better.